Okay, so everybody's talking about AI, ChatGPT, MidJourney, all these different AI tools. And my last episode was all about using AI for productivity. And I'm on this series right now because this is super important to me as a single parent of two kids, one kid who's hospitalized and kind of in a crazy situation right now. I need to leverage my time as much as I can. So I'm super excited about AI, but I'm also wary. I know that there are things that we need to be aware of and we need to maybe avoid or be careful about doing with AI so that it doesn't sink our ship. And so if you saw the last episode and were listening, and if you haven't, go check it out. That one, I talked a lot about Descript and ChatGPT as well as something called Content at Scale. And what I've learned since then, a couple of things. One, and maybe you know this, maybe you don't. When you're using chat GPT, you're entering a query or saying, hey, take this information and transform it into something else like text or you want to do research. Let's say it was like hockey in the U.S. What are the trends? The data that's there is only going to go up to 2021. Chat GPT, open AI, the content that's been pulled in that's related to any news or or events in the world is only going to go up to 2021. And so that's one thing to just be aware of if you're asking it to do some research for you. There are limitations. You got to do your work and then you maybe need to plug in those details and then make it into an article, a blog, marketing, whatever the thing is. So be aware of that. That's number one. Number two is the filters that I mentioned in the last um, episode. So if I want to save a ton of time, everybody's like pushing, make your blog post, make your this, make your that with chat GPT. And yes. It's awesome for brainstorming, creating awesome ideas, getting it out there super fast. However, if you don't put the human element and bake it in and massage the information, you're just generating robot talk, which Google can find. Like Google has filters and they know what's coming strictly from bots and has not been touched by humans. And so if you're trying to build traffic to your website using blogs, using in my case for podcasts for my show notes, there's SEO and things that I'm using that for. If I'm not mindful about cleaning up that content and making it more human, it could actually suppress the search engine results could be suppressed because it's it, this isn't good content. It's created by a bot. So we're going to put this other content that's better because it was human written human thought, human language, we're going to elevate that thing way up here and we're going to suppress and put down this other content. So if you have a competitor, for example, who's got similar content, but they're writing it by hand, they're not using bots or they're using a tool, like I mentioned last week, content at scale, which is much more human in terms of its output. I think it reads 100% human, which is phenomenal. And my test last week, which I use an actual spoken transcript put it into chat GPT and I said, hey, take my words and pull out these salient points, the main points. And in this case, I made it into tweets and you can see that in the other episode, but you can say, make it into a blog post about blah, 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 make it into a summary, whatever. And then when I took that content and put it into one of these checkers that checks for bot AI content, the stuff that I had spoken that was then using chat GPT made into content that came out as human, 100% human. So that may be one way around that problem. You also can use a tool like content at scale, which they charge for that. I think the lowest price is $150. And for that amount, I think you're allowed to generate three or four blog posts of a pretty significant length, maybe 2,500 words. So that's something to check out. But the next piece that I want you to think about is, so we've got the filtering for bot, but also who owns this content? So I was listening to something the other day and it was something I hadn't considered. Okay. If it's your partially your content and you're saying, Hey, make something out of it, or you're just telling chat GPT or whichever tool create a blog post in 74 hockey and the Bobby Orr craze and how it relates to modern day hockey, for example. I don't know why I have hockey on my mind. But if you asked it to do that and then you started posting your content in all these different places, and even if it did work, 
there's a copyright issue that's still in the works that has not been ironed out related to written text. So I looked at the chat GPT. You know, they have something that says, you know, what you generate, the gist of it is what you generate is owned by you. And then there's some other clauses that says pending our terms and conditions and the terms and conditions, and I'll leave the links here if you want to check them out. The terms and conditions basically have some gobbledygook, but it's saying, oh, if you're the person giving you input, like asking a question, hey, here's what I want you to do. You put in the prompt and then you ask for the output. You own that output. Um, the other thing that it says is that this output is not going to be completely original because everybody's, the more people using the tool, the more people asking similar questions, the more likelihood that the content that's churned out is similar. And so that's like a flag, really, do you want your content about, you know, I wouldn't worry about hockey, but if you're doing marketing, business content, social media content, and people are asking the same question, what's the best way to get leads with Instagram? Maybe you're going to end up with an article that's really similar to somebody else who also is trying to do the same thing. And then what happens, and this is why Google has these filters, is because then we're going to have this very blasé internet of content that's just a major echo chamber of stuff that bots went out and got and cobbled together into an article. However, if you take that content and you put your own ideas, uh, you change the words around, you maybe massage that content from your point of view with your voice, that kind of thing, you can make that content shine and you can make it more human. And again, you can set yourself apart from all the other people out there who aren't aware that there's a copyright issue or there are SEO filters and things like that. So really, really important. And the reason why I want to share this now, because I'm on this AI bandwagon for myself, is I don't want to propel people in this AI direction and then look back six months, a year from now and go, oh, I shouldn't have told people to use these tools. But I think if you use them intelligently and you know what some of the risks are, and you can work against the grain a little bit and be more aware maybe of, than some people who are just jumping in and aren't asking smart questions who generate an entire website worth of blog posts or marketing materials and then find that they're suddenly not getting any reach on their website or who knows what's going to happen down the line. So one of the other things that I read when I was reading through this article is the suggestion, it's in the legalese, is that when you do use AI, you should comment somewhere in in the content at the bottom of the content wherever that this content was in part or in some way generated using ai and i don't know that you need to name the tool specifically but i think there may be in the future a requirement for that i don't know these are all things to think about so then it's the copyright part do you want to risk owning or not owning your content. And again, the more you can have a hand in it, the more it's yours. And from this perspective, with the legal waters being a little bit murky right now, when I was doing this research, is that what it's shown is that the other tools that create art content, so Midjourney, if you look at the last episode, the main thumbnail image is from Midjourney. And that is a word to art tool where you type in a word, and you say how you want it to look and they're refining keywords for the type of look and feel. Do I want this to be Japanese ink? Do I want it to be anime? Do I want it to be Disney? You know, there are different styles. I made up Disney. But you can choose these styles and it will generate images that are very specific. You could say, I want a girl sitting by the water near an oak tree. Her foot is in the water. She has pale skin dark hair, she's wearing a pink dress, so you can be very detailed. And then you say the style you want it in. And you can even do refining things about lenses and lighting, and it's just crazy. And then what comes back is beautiful, and you can refine it from there and have other variations made. And then, the reason why I mentioning this is then you own it. So because it's not created by a human, it's out and it's taking these images from who knows where, all over the internet, all over and modifying them, mixing them up. It's not owned by Midjourney. It's owned by you because it's not touching human hands, apparently. So I would say if you're going to leverage AI to create some new things in your business and sell them, 
the things related to art are a little more free and clear than words. So that's just for now. Um, again, content at scale, which I mentioned last week in the article because I was talking about Julia McCoy, who I met and she had a writing business that she sold for millions. Like she did some amazing things and I'm hoping to get her on this and interview her here. So she did all those things, started Content Hacker after selling her company. But because her first company was a writing company, she's been trying to figure out these AI tools and went down on them like, oh, they're awful. There's no human element. And then she found Content at Scale, which is an AI company that generates really beautifully written, natural human long form content that passes these AI checkers. And it's not robotic, it's like 100% human or something close to 100. And because of this copyright question, they explicitly, expressly state that what you use with their tool, what you generate, belongs to you. And so that's a tool you have to pay for. It's, like I said, this $150 is a low end entry point. There's a whole bunch of different levels. But if you want to give it a try, go there. And then that will give you a sense of security around. You're leaving? Okay. I love you. Bye. Have fun tonight. So that, she's off to karate. So that will give you a sense of security around the SEO, not having things filtered and suppressed. It'll give you the security around the copyright piece. And then the other thing is you know, just if you want to orient some of what you're doing, whatever you're coming up with, when you leverage AI and have it be related to art or products in some way, those things are a bit safer in terms of intellectual property. So I highly recommend using the tools and exploring them if it's something you're interested in and you want to save time, generate ideas very quickly. I mean, I've used AI for titles. I've used AI for quick summaries of things for, uh, oh my God, I can't even remember all of that. I've just used it so much this week to help other people in my podcast group with some of the things they were trying to come up with, their podcast descriptions, podcast slug lines, statements, things like that lists of things, doing some research that I know doesn't matter whether it's beyond 2021 or not. And it's been amazing. And I haven't used them as they are. I mean, just knowing the information is what I needed was like, oh, it's doing the research for me. And so on a related note, if you've used one of the other search engines from long ago called Bing, you may have seen a prompt. I wouldn't have even known about this if I hadn't been doing all this AI research, but Bing is are going to release their engine right to their search engine so that when you type in a query on Bing, it's going to start typing just like ChatGPT is and doing research for you and giving you a very specific up-to-date, meaning pulling in current events. It is 2023 content, not 2021. So that's super exciting. I'm on the wait list for when Bing releases it. I haven't gotten the go ahead yet, but if you want to go check it out or type in Bing and you should see large thing that says, do you want to get on the wait list for this? And I believe you have to use their Microsoft Edge browser, which I didn't have, but I downloaded it because I'm highly motivated because the user interface is already, from what I've seen in the sample videos, is very competitive with chat GPT, especially given that there's no downtime, like chat GPT just quits sometimes because, you know, there's a paid version, a free version. It's just like, it's not working. Too many people are trying to use it, that kind of thing. So those are my tips related to AI. Strongly recommend folding it into whatever you're doing, especially if you have to come up with images. And I'll get into doing a mid journey overview as well, but for now, it can save you a ton of time with generating ideas, doing really brief research, generating anything from recipes to summaries, descriptions, bios, like it's a, it's something. Now, I hope there's something here that's real helpful to you, at least makes you aware of what you need to be thinking about and just wishing you a good week. Lots of love to you all and I will see you on the next episode. And you can go check out the last one over here. Thanks.